I became completely obsessed with them when I was seven. I have no idea why. I'm, I'm a fairly obsessive person. And so all of my spare time as a teenager was spent sitting in my blind, taking mostly, in fact, almost all useless photographs of kingfishers. What if your superpower was that you could watch an animal for hours on end? you never get bored. In fact, the longer you watched, the greater your concentration became. That's what happened to National Geographic photographer Charlie Hamilton James. They dive into the water and catch fish. But, you know, Britain is a fairly drab place most of the time. It has a drab selection of birds. I mean, there's some wonderful birds. I'm not much one of the little. <laughs> but um, the kingfish is like a tropical bird because it's so bright and stunning. Kingfishers, these bright blue birds, change color in the light from an iridescent blue to a glistening green. It's actually not blue in the sense that there is no blue pigment in birds. It's the way their feathers are structured and the oils in them which reflect blue light and absorbs other wavelengths oh, really? of light. Yeah. So kingfishers aren't at, you know, they're, they're, they're not pigmented blue. So they're an el- almost electric blue. So they go from, you know, from black to green to turquoise to navy, depending on how the light's hitting them. And Charlie could watch them from a riverbank in Bristol, England, until the rest of the world seemed to evaporate. He could watch them until he started to see the world through their eyes. As a teenager, Charlie got so good at capturing images of these kingfishers that people started noticing. By the time I was 14, 15, the BBC, you know, down the road, knew about this kid who could work with kingfishers. And because they're so bright and colorful, in the UK, we love them. We want them on TV all the Uh time. And I very quickly became the go-to guy for kingfishers. So Wait a um, you're the BBC's go-to guy <laughs> and you're 14 years old? Like, I mean, that's pretty... Yeah, between sort of 14 and 16, it grew. But little did the BBC know that they had a teenage delinquent on their hands. In fact, instead of going to school, Charlie was playing hooky just to film these kingfishers. I can't concentrate on anything I'm not interested in. School to me was a horrific experience and I hated every minute of it. And my mum wasn't that bothered So she kind of enabled me in that sense. And I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to film animals and take photos of animals. I didn't need to go to school to do that. I knew that. Um, And I, you know, I was doing it. And years later, Charlie is still doing it. But how did a teenage photographer go from playing hooky to taking pictures all over the world? Peter Gwynn, and this is Overheard at National Geographic, a show where we eavesdrop on the wild conversations we have here at Nat Geo and follow them to the edges of our big, weird, beautiful world. This week, I sit down to talk with photographer Charlie Hamilton James. He talks about his unlikely journey and the kingfishers, otters, and vultures he's encountered along the way. More after this. When I was in my teens, I wanted to be a wildlife photographer. And I remember going to the, they have this annual competition, this global competition called the Wildlife Photographer of the Year, and meeting the other British wildlife photographers there and realizing that none of them had any money. (laughs) So I decided that actually I don't want to do that. I want to do something where I can actually earn a decent living. Right. So I transitioned my photography to wanting to to work as as a wildlife cameraman at the BBC. Right. So, you know, by, by my mid-teens, I'd kind of... I kind of had, had Geographic Magazine as this dream, but in the immediate and the short term, I wanted to get into TV just because it was a more consistent way of making a living. Right. So when I was 14, I was working... The guy that created Planet Earth, Alistair Fothergill, was a researcher back then. Uh-huh. And Alistair gave me, you know, my first jobs. And then when I was 16, I got my first job working on the David Attenborough series. It was, it was called The Trials of Life. Right. David, David Attenborough, Att- as you call him. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and so that was my first sort of real assisting a, a cameraman to get these shots of kingfishers, these slow motion shots of kingfishers diving into the water, which everyone seemed to love on TV. So you go from being this sort of, you know, precocious, gifted teenager. You were just doing kingfishers, and then you, and then what was your next thing? Otters. 
<laughs> you keep doing these American otter. Don't don't uh, do your American version. I love it when Americans try and say otters because they say otters. Otter. And I'm, no, 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 no. Otter. otters. So um, I, when I was 16, I became equally obsessed with otters, and I saved up my money and I applied for a grant from my school, a bursary from my school that. Had, I'd left in such disgrace um, because I think the headmaster had kind of have a soft spot for this kid. Who just, I just couldn't play by the rules. I hated authority. I couldn't play by the rules. But I think he's, he had a kind of soft spot for me. So they gave me, I think they gave me 500 pounds of a travel bursary. And so I combined that with a load of money I'd earn and a couple of hundred pounds my mum gave me. And I went off to the Shetland Islands, which had far, you know, the furthest m- most point of the UK, basically, way up there. Um, in the North Sea, this little archipelago. And I spent six weeks walking the beaches photographing otters because I had become obsessed with otters. So, Wow. So, like, the kid who doesn't want to go to school gets money from the school to go shoot you know, was, otters. That's, pretty, that's a pretty ingenious plan you've worked out there. It was, it was. I was very lucky. I understand my privilege as a result, but I was very lucky because... I chose otters and kingfishers, and they were the two probably, f- f- for all the animals filmed in the UK, those were the two animals probably in the highest demand. They were very difficult, both of them. Otters are really difficult to film. You know, and I remember in my mid-30s, I spent an entire year just working on kingfishers and otters. I didn't still, know in your other, 30s, uh, like yeah. half your life later. Yes, still doing it. There were other years when I didn't, but I remember, you know. Right. Just doing kingfishers and otters. It was just relentless kingfishers and otters. So it's, I was really lucky that I chose those two subjects to get obsessed with. We'll be back with more Charlie Hamilton James after this. So what was your first assignment of geographic? This was a, actually a major turning point in my career because I got this film commissioned by the BBC. I went off to start making it, and they said, oh, we want this kind of cute, funny film about vultures. And I got out to Kenya and Tanzania and realized that, you know, vultures are in catastrophic decline across the, certainly um, Africa and Asia. And, you know, I, uh, I really struggled to make a quirky, funny film about, you know, the fastest declining family of species in history. It's not Sounds something... Sounds hilarious, man. Yeah. <laughs> so we made this film, and I sat there editing it, and the executive producer and I ended up just banging our heads against each other because I wanted to make a conservation film. He wanted a wildlife film. And in the end, he said, you can have five minutes of conservation in it. And I thought that was wrong, like fundamentally wrong. And in the end, I got 15 minutes conservation in it. So it was a compromise. And, you know, I look back and think, okay, well, fair enough. He was probably right to an extent because who wants to be depressed and watch Sunday night TV and be depressed for an hour? No one does. Anyway, so Geographic came to me at the time. And uh, I remember having a conversation with uh, my editor for the story, who was Ken Geiger. And he phoned me up and he said, hey, we're going to do a kind of quirky, funny story on Vulture. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So I gave him the, my pitch, which is a very passionate, you know, pitch about what amazing uh, t- struggle these birds, this catastrophe that was going on. And he turns around and he said, oh, my God, this is really, we should do, a, you know, a big geopolitical story on this. And I thought, I want to work for these people. <laughs> I want to work for people who are going to take on, and I don't want to diminish the BBC, they're amazing. But I just at that point thought, do you know, I want to work for people who are going to tell stories like this mm-hmm. because these stories need telling. So what was what was it about vultures, you know, cuz you have you know, you stated you have this notorious you know, short attention span for things you're not interested in. So what did you find about vultures that kept you focused? I love anti-heroes. I made a film on hyenas many years ago for the BBC. The, and and then I pitched vultures because People overlook hyenas, people overlook vultures. So if you want to get something commissioned, they're perfect. They're very charismatic, even though they're disgusting and ugly. But they are charismatic, and they're, as a result, inherently interesting. What do you mean charismatic? How are they charismatic? Well, they're scary. Have you ever heard of a thick knee? No. It's a thickening? little plover that wanders around on the plains of Africa. Okay. But you've heard of a vulture, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because the thick knee's got no charisma and the vulture's got charisma. You're Fair like, enough. awesome. Look at that bird. It's amazing. <laughs> God damn, it's ugly. Yeah. 
So they have this kind of anti-charisma, let's say. Okay, right. My job is to convince an audience that actually look past the ugliness. These are incredible, you know, machines, basically. These are amazing animals. Mm-hmm. Look at them. Mm-hmm. And that's a, it's a really lovely thing to be able to do, mm-hmm. is to turn the tables on someone's received narrative on something. Right. So did you have to come up with any sort of like duct tape inventions oh. To, oh to, to to get vultures yeah absolutely um i i mean the key, the key shot was this kind of inside the carcass shot if you can keep the frenzy going because mm-hmm. when vultures eat they it's a very slow process until they frenzy and the moment they frenzy they're what does that mean frenzy? they what are going like? absolutely crazy you know you've got 50 vultures having a crazed fight over a carcass If you can drive in, drop your camera and get out fast enough, they come back in and carry on, and then they don't notice the camera. Wow, wow. <laughs> but if you, if you leave it two seconds too long, one vulture has to stop and then the whole lot stop. And that's it, it's all over. No one's going in. <laughs> so there's this whole timing kind of element. Yeah, it's just yeah, crazy. Like this- Oh. But the eventual shot was, it was a really cool shot. And again, it tells, you know, as I was talking about, what does it look like? What does it look like? It's this big, it's, it's in a zebra rib, rib cage. And it's a big foot of a vulture and a head coming in. And then all the way back, it's got these different layers of vultures in the background. And you can see the sort of black and white of the zebra skin. And, you know, it's, you can see the planes in the background. So, you know, you've got a story in one shot. Yeah. And you've got an immersive experience for the reader to open the magazine. And wow, you've got this kind of what it's like to be inside that carcass with them. So let me ask you about, um, you have a son, Fred. Um, How old is he now? He's like- 19. He's 19, wow. When I think we first met, it was right around the time that Fred had been diagnosed with a medical condition. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I might cry, but I'll talk about it. <laughs> the whole purpose, of, the, the story the whole purpose of, of this interview is to make you... All right, so I, okay, I'm gonna, I'll tell the but story. But I know it's an, I'm kidding, but, I, uh, but I'm not kidding in the sense that it's an important event in your life. Yeah, it's the important event in my life, I think. But it's also an incredible story. And I'll tell you the story because it I, it still blows me away. So Fred's one day, he's looking at his phone. He keeps moaning about headaches. He keeps moaning he's tired. He's always asleep. And we're like, oh, he's just a teenager. You know, he's 16. He's, of course, he's lazy and tired. I was at that age. And he's looking at his phone very closely all the time. I think, I wonder if he's, yeah, he needs his eye test. So I take him into town for an eye test. And the, and the optician comes and gets me. And I'm like, oh. This is odd. He pulls me aside and says, has he got Lyme's disease? I'm like, no. And he pulls up the pictures of his optic nerves, and he's he's got impacted optic nerves, you know, they're, they're swollen on both sides. And we're looking at it, and he's, and I, I grew up in a medical family, so I'm like, that can't be a brain tumor because it's bilateral. Normally, if you have a brain tumor, you just get one optic nerve swollen, but this was two, and I'm like, oh. anyway, he's, look, get him checked out. So the next day, my wife takes him off to the specialist. And this guy says, this kid needs an MRI now. They airlift him to Salt Lake. He goes off with his mum. I drive down. They take the thing out the next day. So it, it's, it is a tumour then? Oh, sorry, yes. It's a massive... Well, it's not ma- it's, it's the size of a peach brain tumour in his right frontal cortex. Wow. Um, and, you know, on the scan, it's just this... It's, just so, it's this massive great blob in his head. So... For about four years, Fred's been asking me if he can become a falconer. Falconer. And I'm saying no, because I'm a miserable old git, as we would say in the UK. <laughs> I know we move everywhere. Life's too complicated. You're not having a falcon. And he's, like, oh, and he's just relentless. And after a couple of years, you think, all right, this isn't just a fad. The kid is genuinely yeah. interested. He had read every single book. He was obsessed with falconry, and I recognized that obsession, but I couldn't facilitate it because I was, I guess, probably being selfish. Anyway, he goes in. He has this brain tumor taken out. They take the whole side of his head off. He's got this beautiful blonde hair. 
and they you know they shave this thing they just take the side of his head off pull this thing out put his head back together he wakes up at like two in the morning off his head on morphine or whatever you know yeah. just off his head and there's a nurse at the end of the bed and he wakes up and goes oh hi my name's fred i'm a falconer <laughs> I'm a... <laughs> and then he turns to me and philip and he says Dad, can I get a falcon? <laughs> and I said, Fred, you can have whatever you want. <laughs> wow. So a couple of weeks goes by. We don't know what this thing is. What is this brain tumor? Is it bad? Is it good? What, we don't know what it is. The pathology. <laughs> they said, oh, we'll know next week. It's taken two weeks. Three weeks. And it's, you know, it's August. And it's the most horrifying experience as a parent to not know whether your kid's going to die or not. Yeah. And I'm walking into the grocery store one day my phone rings it's Salt Lake and they go look we're going to tell you and I'm like oh because I knew the moment they said they were going to tell me what it was that it was and they said it's, it's a low grade glioma it's not going to kill him it's you know if it grows back we'll take it out again wow. and you know oh. anyway Fred's got to get a bird I promised them <laughs> so here's the thing America there's a lot of laws <laughs> That's As right. I say to my American buddies, you got a lot of laws protecting your freedom. <laughs> right, so, and you know our falcons. <laughs> yeah. And actually, you know what? Great. So you should have a lot of laws protecting your falcons. So Fred is allowed like a couple of different birds. There's lots of falcons and hawks and eagles and everything yeah, in the States. Right. But he's really only allowed a couple of them because he's a, he's, an, he's a novice. Yeah. You have to go through stages. You have to do exams. You have to. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So Fred yeah. is basically allowed a red-tailed hawk where we live. Okay. Okay. So he has to, we, we build him this muse, this aviary, uh -huh. his friend Roger, who's a master falconer and mentors Fred. Um, Fred has to go and catch a red-tailed hawk once he's built the aviary and everything You just else. don't buy one. You don't go down no, to the pet you, store and buy a red-tailed no, hawk. No, this, this is where the story gets really cool. Okay. He can catch a wild red tail, but it has to have been born that year, right? So it's okay. called a passage bird. It's migrating south. You catch it in the fall. It's its first year. It's not an adult. It's never bred before. These are the rules. This is These like, are the rules. Yeah, okay. If you catch an adult, you have to let it go. Okay, so to catch one, you get some mice from the mouse store. <laughs> <laughs> and you put them in a thing called a belshakri, which is this trap. And you put them in a tank so the bird can't get them, but the bird flies down trying to get them. So you basically drive around until you see a bird. You put this trap thing down. Yeah. It's got these mice. The bird flies in. It gets its leg caught in a leg snare thing. It doesn't injure it or damage it. And then you run out and you pick the bird up. And then that's your bird. You then train from a, from wild. Okay. So Fred says to me, oh, Dad, I want a female dark morph red tail. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, really? You want a female dark morph passage red. So it's got to be born that year. It's got to be a dark one. There's light, normal red tails and dark red tails, like three different color morphs. And he wants a female. But yeah, of course he did. <laughs> so they go and buy some mice, him and his mom. The next day, we're going to trap this bird for him, and it's going to be his bird for life, blah, blah, blah. Next day, the neighbor phones up. She says, oh, you got an eagle stuck in your fence. And Fred goes running up the garden. This is very <laughs> I always lose it here. And on the ground is a dark morph female passage red tail. He picks it up. And that's his bird. Wow. He doesn't even catch it. In just, one day. He just goes up the garden. There's a bird on the ground that's flown into our garden fence. And he just and it's exactly what and he just picks it up. And that's his bird. How cool is that? Well, Charlie Hamilton James, thank you very much. Thank you. To see some of Charlie's photographs, including his National Geographic stories on kingfishers, otters, and vultures, check out the links in our show notes. They're right there in your podcast app. You can also find his photographs on our Instagram feed, at NatGeo. Overheard at National Geographic is produced by Laura Sim, Brian Gutierrez, Jacob Pinter, Carla Wills, and Alana Strauss. Our senior editor is Eli Chin. This episode was edited by Robert Molesky. Our executive producer of audio is Devar Ardalan. Our fact checkers are Michelle Harris, Robin Palmer, and Julie Beer. Our copy editor is Amy Kolzak. 
Hansdale Sue sound designed this episode and composed our theme music. This podcast is a production of National Geographic Partners. Whitney Johnson is the Director of Visuals and Immersive Experiences. Susan Goldberg is National Geographic's Editorial Director. And I'm your host, Peter Gwynn. Thanks for listening, and see you all next time.